All again, are we okay? Thanks for tuning in. Well, back to normal today. Um, uh, everyone's observing the protocols quite nicely for the first hour of uh, business that we've had today. Shops are closed, so to speak. The front door's open, so we can still get things for members. Um, everyone's a bit nervous on the first tee. They're not swung for a couple of months, which has been quite funny. The healthy divots taken, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> the first, all in good humour. So, Good morning, Mel. Hope you're okay. I'm not sure there'll be as many tuned in today with the golf course being open. I know Simon Dixon, who, excuse me, has been a regular. Uh, just seeing him on the golf course, he's uh, extremely pleased to be back, that's for sure. Are you uh, booked into play soon, Ian and Mel? Have you got your tea time up for next week? I would think the, uh, well, you and I have a, a, a trackman session as soon as possible. I'm just working out my diary. Oh, well done, Mill, uh, Ian. Uh, I'm just working out my diary. I'm um, going to get through this weekend. I'm just putting a road trip in place for next week. Uh, but you and I will get on the uh, the old trackman, Ian. Um, I think you'll really enjoy that. Uh, and then also I think that the first few days are going to be very manic while everyone tries, just tries to get back out and then it'll settle down to a more normal rhythm anyway. Good morning, Brian. Back in my box. <laughs> Where I belong, right? Well, I can't do off the first tee now. Just saying, Brian, there's two, uh, two very healthy divots been taken off the first tee by some rusty golfers. Uh, so the I, don't, I don't have the place to myself anymore. I've sort of lost that billionaire status of coming to my private golf club and just hitting balls wherever I want, sadly. All right, I'll give it one more minute. I don't think we'll have as many on today, obviously, because we're a bit more back to normal. I'll give it one more minute, and then we'll go. In fact, so did I get a, a WhatsApp of you last night, Brian? Yes, I did. I forgot to reply to that, didn't I? But when the old Captain Pro Challenge is back up and running, we'll take you on. Hopefully I've confused you enough now with the past seven weeks that you'll have so many swing thoughts in your head, you'll lose all your natural ability. <laughs> all right, I think we'll get started. A very, very warm welcome to you all. Thanks ever so much for tuning in. 
Um, I was going to do wedges today, but I've done it twice this week. So there's a couple of videos, um, one uh, indoors and then one uh, from the first tee, which I've done. One, uh, The first tee one focused on um, how you can create different distances. Um, thanks, Brian. Um, how you can create different distances with different swings, uh, with, uh, with the different wedges in your bag. Today, I'm going to talk a bit more about the gapping, the distances between your clubs. It's such an important uh, thing to understand this and where uh, it's all born, where it's uh, where the distance gapping comes from. It's different from player to player. And we'll start by looking at the, the tour pros difference in gapping um, and then how that relates back to us here on planet Earth. So when I look at my bag, I have a slightly unusual makeup of a set. It's not... Uh, uh, unusual for a pro, uh, but it's slightly unusual for a pro. Not, 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 uh, not the run of the mill. So, I've got my driver. Obviously, my indiscriminate distance club, which will go as far as possible. I then have a three wood, probably the weakest club uh, in my bag. Uh, when it's good, it's good. When it's bad, it's horrible. Um, but I accept that. Uh, I would say that probably my most nervous club off the fairway would be uh, uh, with a three wood. I don't expect it as many good shots to do with uh, the other clubs. I then have quite a big gap because the the, uh, the loft on my three wood is 15 degrees at its natural loft. I haven't tweaked that club at all. And then I go from 15 degrees all the way up to my rescue wood here, which is 21 degrees. So a six degree gap between those clubs there. Now, the reason for that is that the, um, the reason why I have that big gap is that I think of my driver and my three wood as indiscriminate distance clubs. I'm trying to get as much distance as I can on the golf course. And if you look at every tour professional's bag, they'll have a driver and a three wood. And then after that, it starts getting a little bit more uh, down to uh, personal choice. Tiger was very famously carried a five wood throughout all his career. Um, Mickelson was the same. He often carried a five wood. Uh, Mickelson's five wood, uh, he would use to carry the ball the same distance as our sixth hole of the hill. That's a 265 yard hole. That was Mickelson's carry range. Now, uh, I can get on that green by jumping on a three wood, but no, near with a five, but it just shows you how powerful these guys are. And the thing is, they're doing that week in, week out, shot in, shot out. So their uh, reliability is really what makes them understand their yardages. So the reason why I have that big gap is I take those two clubs as my indiscriminate distance. If I do get into trouble, I then have my rescue wood to dig me out of trouble. The distance then uh, goes into my irons. Gapping then goes to my irons, I beg your pardon. So I then go from my rescue wood and my three iron. Now I actually hit my three iron further than my rescue wood, but I can only have uh, one or two shots in the armory with the three iron, whereas a rescue wood has far more versatility. And this is why we tend to sell so many more rescue woods. And indeed, uh, I did a ladies session a couple of weeks ago, and I talked about Annika Sorenston's bag. She has four woods in the bag, uh, five irons in the bag, four wedges and a putter. They've got the numbers right there. Uh, now, obviously, she flits in between putting more woods in and more irons and fewer wedges or more wedges in, depending on the course she's playing and also how her game's playing. If you remember when I talked a couple of weeks ago about the Jack Nicholas has a gimmick uh, for every uh, week where he, he, he tries something new and tries something different, then that applies to their golf equipment. Now, I must tell you an absolutely true story here because I've read it in the, uh, one of Jack Nicholas's books. In 1979, he pared down his... Uh, playing season to about eight or nine tournaments and his caddy and him wrote a book where his caddy tells a story and at the end of the, uh, the chapter Jack Nicholas uh, chimes in with his response to that chapter's story anyway the caddy was uh, a good time Charlie he liked to drink he liked uh, gambling and all other manner of uh, unhealthy behavior anyway what uh, he writes in the book he said in those days the caddy was responsible for taking the clubs home now they stay on site the players have a locker but in those days the uh, the, the players, it was very um, rough and ready golf back in the day, even at the, the tournament level. So bear in mind, Jack Nicholas is playing eight tournaments a year, there and thereabouts, and he's uh, four of those in the major championships. He's only playing four other events. And his caddy was taking the clubs home, back to his flea pit motel, and then going, tearing it up at night, and uh, sort of waking up in the morning, and uh, not always in his own uh, flea pit. Anyway, uh, his caddy turned up late for a tournament, and Nicholas said, I'm stood in the first tee, waiting for my caddy. I'm, I know what Angelo's done. He's late for the, the event. He said, I go to the pro shop. I borrow a set of clubs off the pro. Next week, same thing happens. Third week, same things happen, right? And Nicholas says, uh, I went into the pro shop, and the pro had nothing to lend me, so I had to buy a set. Now, the world's best player buying a set. Now, if you think now at tournaments now, they have all the big caravans, and they have all the uh, 
uh, uh, everything on hand. That there's no way a player would be without any equipment now because they're just swamped with uh, equipment at the events. He goes in and he buys the wrong set. He buys a set of shafts which are completely unsuitable. And Nicholas gets in the first hole. He's playing down the first hole. These don't feel right. And he realizes his mistake. And he goes down and has to play one of his own eight events with a borrowed set of clubs. He still hired the same caddy. They, they, they stayed great friends throughout their career. And, and Nicholas just said, ah, it's just one of those things. I made him sweat, made him think that I wasn't going to have him in my, on my bag for a week. Now, the versatility of the pros back then was much greater because they had to do things more with, with hand, and arm, hand and eye and feel. And also with their equipment, they'd go back home and they'd drill holes in the wood. They'd pour lead in, they'd take lead out. And also they would shape the woods as well. So um, if we look at equipment here now, uh, I can unscrew the hair, take it off, and I can add loft. I can close the face to, or I can open the face a little bit, depending on what I'm trying to achieve with the club. Back then, the players would take off what's called a base plate, which is a brass plate here. They take it off. Underneath there would be the weight of the club, because uh, a wooden head on its own simply doesn't have enough weight. And so, in the middle there, we would pour lead, uh, and then we'd scrape lead out uh, relative to what the players uh, were looking for, what sort of weight they were. Now, my first boss was a master club maker for tour professionals, and we would regularly get tour professionals' heads uh, come to the shop. He would take them off and then drill the weight uh, in and out for the players, or he'd even shave parts off the club so it would sit differently. So if they shaved a, a corner off the front here, that club would then sit down a bit more and it would close the face a little bit. If they shaved off the back here, the face would sit a bit more open. And most tour professionals, even now, would like their club to sit slightly open. And the reason for that is they know a hook goes much more off target for them. If the face is uh, closing in like that, it, for, in their level, it will go left, left, what they call a double cross. And so if the face sits slightly open, they don't become too fearful of that. And we know the optimum way to hit a draw, starting right and coming back to the target, is with a slightly open face anyway, as we talked about in a previous session. So when I talk about the quirkiness of the sets, the pros are changing their clubs all the time. Um, Many of the wedges will use a brand new, uh, many of the pros will use brand new wedges every event because uh, they want to have consistent spin. Now, if you look at uh, my wedge, I spin the ball a lot anyway. I don't really care about creating more, so I don't re um, replace my wedges that often. The grooves wear down because the grit and the sand in the bunkers and the strike of a divot gets in there and just chips away at the grooves. And the grooves provide most of the spin from a quality strike. So they'll have consistent grooves on the face. And again, if you look back at some of the wedges of the great players from yesteryear, the faces are worn out. They have an indent where they've been hitting the ball over and over again. And when we look at the face like that, there's an indent in the face, and the grooves are a little bit wonky as a result. So it's remarkable to think that those players were shooting the scores they were with equipment which was nowhere near optimum. Now, um, I said to you before that the golf courses now are only about 10 to 12% longer than they were in the 1950s and the 1960s. Uh, the golf ball is about 70% as powerful then as it is now. So think of that. It's remarkable. Uh, good morning, Michael. No problem at all. Late on the tee, two-shot penalty for you. Um, and, of course, the, the ball is 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 uh, uh, so much better. They're using TrackMan. They use all the science. They've got everything at their fingertips. And the scores they're shooting aren't loads better uh, than the players of yesteryear. Who knows why the reason that is? What well, the reason that is? Okay, so when I look at my back there, my rescuer has lots of purposes. I've got plenty of loft on it. I'm quite versatile with that club. And when I move the ball in my stance, uh, back in the stance for ropey lies or in its optimum position, which is left of centre for me, then I change the height profile of the ball. And because I've got so much loft on the club face, moving that loft backwards and forwards has quite a big benefit. When I move it back in the stance. I get a sweeter strike and I hit down on the ball, but of course it comes out lower. In its optimum position, I'm getting plenty of height. So the first shot I struck for us to analyze today is a rescue wood. Hit it pretty well. You see my swing speed in here, normally with the driver, 105, 106, then thereabouts. The rescue was a much shorter club and therefore the leverage is a lot less and therefore I, can, I can't swing it as quickly, obviously. Ball speed, 131, not bad. Carried it 190. Now, because it's got a nice height trajectory, the rescue wood, and you know I'm a low ball flighter anyway, so I need a lofty club in my bag. My ball has risen beyond the optimum quite early. As a consequence of that, it lands a bit more steeply and I lose a little bit of roll, which is great. I want that. I know what that club does, and that's why I use it with so much loft on it. Now, my club path 6.3 on the inside. We're going to look at that a bit today and see how that varies when I move down to uh, shorter clubs. Face angle slightly open, and of course we discussed this, because my path is very heavy on the inside, 
that creates a banking on the ball where the ball banks left, even with an open face. If my club face, club path, I beg your pardon, the path into the ball was two degrees, plus two degrees, and the face was open plus two degrees, that ball would stay right at target. Because my path is heavier on the inside than my face angle there, then I get a little draw. So from our aerial view here, hitting here, that ball we see banks over to the left here. So the spin axis on that ball was minus 7.3. A zero zero axis would be that minus 7.3 is that my golf ball is tipping that way because I hit from the inside. By Sorry about that. Hope you're okay after that fall. Um, all righty. So, because I hit heavily from the inside here, that club hits the ball and it banks the ball on an axis seven degrees left of target. As I've said to you before, there's negotiables and, and um, absolutes in golf. You have to work out what's negotiable and variable in your swing. So if we then look at the height there, 105 foot of height, what uh, Trackman's telling me is at 91 miles per hour with the rescue wood, that is absolutely optimum height there, 105. It fits in the blue bar then and we've, then we've optimized it. And this is one thing which Trackman uh, proved to us, was that the tour professionals have to hit the ball the same height with every club. Pitching wedge height profile is that, driver's height profile is that, but they're both apex at 100 foot there and thereabouts. And uh, um, Jason Duffner was the first player to really say, I want to hit everything at 100 foot high. And so he optimized his game based on Trackman knowledge and got everything to fly at 100 foot. I then work my way through the bag. So my crossover point is between my rescue wood and my three iron. Both will go similar sort of distance. Now, the further, you, historically, well, it's only 10 yards difference between each club. And that can't be true for everybody because the further you hit a golf ball, the wider those gaps become. So if you're a very powerful hitter, those gaps become, you know, 12 to 15 yards. Now, if we then look at the, the Tor Pro average here, let me try and get you into the screen so I can see it as well. Okay, I want to uh, look at this screen here. So, a Tor Pro carries their pitching wedge there. I hope you can see that. Yes, you can. 136. They carry their 9 iron 12 yards further at 148. Another 12 yards then for the 8 iron. Another 12 yards for the 7 iron. So, think of that. A carry with the 7 iron is 172. That's a long, long way there. Now, the pros, uh, the quality of strike and the height they hit the ball 100 foot, there's not going to be an awful lot of roll on that ball uh, unless the ground is firm or they're trying to send the ball in a bit lower where they'll, they'll lower the profile of ball flight and send it in low to run the ball. And pros will do that when the pin's at the back of a green. If the pin's at the front of a green, a pro will try and hit the ball high as possible to that landing spot. If it's the back of the green, they'll try and get it to land at the front or the middle of the green to run up to the target. A ball running to the target has got much more chance of going in or close to its target. A ball landing and stopping has to be so precise because the landing area is only one and a half inches uh, uh, wide and the ball has to stop quickly. So if his 7 iron then is going 172, 183, 6 irons, there's only 11 yards there, then 11 yards again with a 5 iron, and then what we've got there is it's only uh, 9 yards difference there between the um, 4 iron and the 3 iron, and then another 9 yards between 4 iron and 3 iron, Three iron to hybrid, that's a very much a moving feast, and the averages there, I think, can be uh, highly debated. Five was carrying 230, and like I said, when you think of Mickelson carrying it 265, it just shows why uh, Mickelson, Dustin Johnson, McElroy, Woods, Kepka, these guys are the best. They, the, for whatever reason, they're significantly longer, or they're significantly more consistent with their length than uh, the other players. And it's quite hard to fathom that. So if you look at the percentage difference between, say, Usain Bolt or people who win the, uh, uh, the Olympic running for the two extremes there. I wonder what the percentages are there between them and the sort of main body of the field. I wonder if it's that same sort of, you know, almost 10% difference there. So if you look at then the, the five would go in 230, three would only go in 243. It's only going 13 yards further in carry, but they will get a significant more roll with that three would. And then the driver averages at 275. Now, there's loads of examples we could find online. Of the pros hitting the ball significantly longer than that. Um, and there's 
not many examples of hitting the ball less distance than that. And I always found that when the pros played at uh, Loch Lomond in the Scottish Open when it was held there, they looked very short by comparison because there's not much run at Loch Lomond. It's right, it's quite a damp golf course. It's a beautiful golf course, um, but the fairways can be quite moist. They're quite flat golf course as well, so they're not getting balls with the flattering bounce down a hill. And sometimes when you go and play championship courses, it's amazing how hilly they are because when you look on television, they don't look quite so hilly. So if you look back at my uh, data here on the old uh, uh, wrestling with the hip, I carry it at 190 for a total 198. Now, if I change this face angle, I'll try and keep my path pretty similar. Pass at 6.3. If I close that face angle, I'm going to start trying to corrupt a lofty club here. So 190 gave me 198 total. I'm now going to swing at six point something on the inside, hopefully then thereabouts, but I'm going to close the face over to produce a bit more roll distance. I'm going to pull the ball back in my stance as well. Well, there we go. So 190 gave me 198, so eight yards of roll. By hooking the ball, I increased my path dramatically there to 17 degrees. And my face is actually more open there, but look at this. My path is so, so heavy, because I aim further right, ball back in the stands, that relative to where I was aiming, that ball actually was, uh, club face was actually closed by 11 degrees relative to my path. The ball came out much, much lower uh, at 75 foot. Carried it 10 yards further, we've got 15 yards more roll. So that really illustrates to you why I always try and get you to try and get the ball moving to the left. So Brian, in your case, I get the ball moving left. It's the first thing we do every lesson. Uh, in your case, it's slightly different because you are a bit of a hooker of the ball and you actually control the ball much better with a, um, a, a fade. You look at the height profile of the shot there. That ball's come out there, much lower than the optimum profile. If you look at my aerial view, it's a horrendous shot. I would have to aim that shot out to that bunker to hook it back in. But that's how I squeeze 15 yards more distance out of it. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about this face to path. If I go back one shot, I played a draw spin, because our aerial path shows that. My club face was open, but it was closed to my path. So I'm gonna just discuss that again. I know we've talked about a little about, about a little while, a few weeks ago, but um, just so I can illustrate the point here. The first measurement of club face open or closed is a simple measurement from the target. A trap man is to within 0.1 of an inch of that target when it's measured or 0.1 of a degree. Is my club face open to that target or is it closed to that target? My swing pace face to my path measures how closed or open my club face was relative to the way I'm swinging. So if I point myself way over to the right over here, swing from the inside, but square my club face up relative to me, then the club face will say, okay, it's square to your path. But relative to that target, if I've aimed 10 degrees right of target, the club face could well be open 10 degrees to the right of target. So when we measure club face, there's two ways of measuring it. One is relative to the target, and the second is relative to your swing. And that's why when I say, oh, you hit a draw with an open face, it's slightly cheating, because that face could well be square to the path, or even slightly close to the path we're swinging on. Now, in terms of absolutely optimizing distance, we as professionals have done everything we can in our own game to squeeze every yard and every degree into hitting the ball further and further. Now, as I've said before, I've retooled my entire coaching, retooled my entire swing, and my whole uh, dialogue on the game based on working with a long distance coach. And this is the future of the game. Because if you look at uh, Bryson DeChambeau now, he must be two stone heavier. He's put uh, 20, 30 yards of distance onto his swing. And his swing tempo is about a third faster. So his old swing would have been one, two, three, four, five, six. It's now one, two, three, four. And so he's much, much quicker, rips it back faster. The fastest back swings in the world hit the ball the furthest distance. Not at club level, I assure you, but at uh, long distance level, they absolutely do. So when I want to corrupt distance on my clubs, um, and you can see I've gone from a 190 carry to 200 yard carry by closing the face relative to my path. Uh, and I've gone from a 198 total distance to 215 total distance. You can see why we optimize and close the face relative to our, to our swing path. So going back to gapping then, how does that affect your gapping? Well, 
if I take a nine iron here, I'm now going to really corrupt this club by aiming right, closing my face relative to my path, all the way back in the stance. Horrible swing. All right. Eight to seven club head speed. Let's compare that to a tour pro. 85. So I swung it two miles an hour faster than the tour pro there because I corrupted my swing. Now, it's all very well said. Oh, wow, you know, you've hit that ball 148 yards with your, your, your nine iron. But what is it? 30 yards off target? Oh, there you go. It's, it's 76 foot off target. It's an uncontrollable shot. It had 16 yards of roll. Now, if you think most of the greens at Rehampton Club are say 30 yards front to back, then 16 yards of roll is uncontrollable. So it's a redundant shot. Now I have loads of people who come for less and say, oh, I hit my 9 950 yards. Well, that's great, but it doesn't sequence its way through the bag. And what happens is, if we look here uh, at the height, I hit that ball 43 foot of height, which is a disaster for a 9 iron. My optimal height is twice that at 90 foot. I went to 43, 90 foot there. But I'm doing that with a club with 40 degrees of face angle. Now, if I hook it over like that, it's down to 20 degrees. I've taken 20 degrees off the club. I can't do that with a five iron because I'd have negative loft. The ball would never get airborne, no matter who hit it. If I do it with a driver, I wouldn't carry the ball more than a yard. It just goes straight into the ground. So corrupting the club with the short times, um, we do an awful lot with uh, higher handicappers because it gives them a sense that they are hitting the ball well. But then what happens is that club... Uh, yardage they tend to bunch in the middle and so you have many amateur golfers particularly lady golfers and what they'll say is um oh, i've got a set of clubs in my bag but my seven wood my five wood my rescue wood and my five and all seem to go more or less the same distance and that's because those clubs aren't being swung quickly enough now when i'm corrupting a club here and i do this with you brian every session we have i get to aim right at target you get to close your face relative to your path and we start corrupting the draw uh, the club it's a great way of getting that smack into the back of the ball. So lofted clubs with a good bang at the back of the ball train us to close the face relative to our path. Now, unfortunately, if we then got into, uh, if we keep doing that with all our shots, there comes a point where the, uh, two or three of the clubs start to look a little bit similar, but they'll have different profiles, but they'll have a similar sort of bunching of distance in the bag. And that's when I say, I look at my bag there, it looks quite quirky. What I do know is that I uh, fiddle around my swing an awful lot uh, when I'm playing. Uh, so I can uh, uh, bridge those seemingly big gaps in my bag uh, to do that. Now, I sent out uh, an email in the recorder a few months ago where I talked about the effects of wind on the ball. It was really illuminating to me as well because it showed that um, the tour pros gain uh, a lot less going downwind than they lose going into the wind. And the spread between a shot into a 30-mile-an-hour wind and a shot 30-mile-an-hour downwind was about 60 yards with the 6 iron. So one of the trick questions we ask every golfer is, oh, how far do you hit your seven? Uh, and most people say, oh, I hit it 150. Well, you don't. You, you might hit it 150 once, but sometimes 130, and sometimes it might be 160, 170. Um, so it's hard to say what the average is. So the best way to think of your gapping is in, in what range do I hit these clubs? Now, if I know uh, I've hit my three iron not long ago, 250 yards, I've also used it more than 670 yards. Both swings are pretty full. When I hit it 250, I corrupt it and really got a massive big old closed club face relative to my very heavy inside path and got lots of run on the ball. The 160 shot, I'm into a terrible wind, soggy lie, uphill, blah, blah, blah. So think about the range in which the, the shots uh, are hit. Now, what we did see with the tour pros when we looked at their gapping, it's not uniform. Even at their level, it's not uniform. Now, those are the averages. So you're taking a lot of things into the, uh, uh, the mix there. If you look at a tour professional... Uh, what they may well do is have a set of clubs which aren't uniform to take into account their quirks and they might have a six iron which is slightly lofted and a seven iron which is slightly less lofted because that's the inflection point when all their sort of quirks in their swing come together and then they get this sort of uh, uh, problem which needs to be solved. Very famously, uh, Bobby Jones played his entire career. 13 majors in eight years. Bobby Jones, incredible. Uh, retired at 29. Uh, so he won all those majors in eight years. And when they started analyzing his equipment, 
Uh, it turned out his six and seven were the wrong way around. Uh, what he thought was his six was actually his seven, and vice versa. But of course, you know, he still won major championships. I found out last night, <laughs> if we look at what's called the lie angle here, measured from horizontal to this angle here, then shorter players need that angle to be flatter because they're lower to the ground, and so the club will sit on the ground, the shaft will come out at a flatter angle. Tall people tend to stand taller, and therefore the shaft angle has to be more upright. Hogan's irons were actually six degrees flat. Now, he wasn't particularly short, five foot nine, but it's just the way he swung. Now, six degrees, I assure you, you could not hit. You'd hit a massive slice because the club would sit on the ground like this and it would twist on the face like that. So, I'm now going to hit a shot my three iron. So, if I say that the range in which my... Oh, by the way, I meant to say about this as well. About trackman, the uh, I think that the, the the trackman roll is quite generous. So I carried my uh, first rescue with 190, and my second rescue would uh, total distance was 215. So that's a 25 yard spread between those clubs. Um, in terms of the, the shortest carry and the longest total distance, and I'm having a three eye on a normal swing. That really illustrates my point because I swung the rescue at 91, I swung the three iron at 92.6. My first rescue I carried 190, I carried that one 190.9 um, for a total distance. That one went, uh, when my rescue had carried 190 for a 198 total, that one's gone 191 for a 201 total. So, what I'm saying to you there is that, oh, yeah, I've got an overlap in that bag, but it won't be the same all the time. This is where we have to be quite flexible on our choice of clubs and how we play the game. Trackman is a great way of measuring. It's a great way of understanding. And the people who tune into this session here are like me. They love the data. It doesn't make you a better golfer, and it doesn't create the, the artistry that's in the game, which we have to uh, use after we understand the data. Now, if you never understood anything that we're talking about in this room, it doesn't make you a worse golfer. It just means you sort of have less knowledge. But people who are watching this, you know, you're so thirsty to know these things that it makes the game as enjoyable. And the intellectual side of the game is fascinating. So if I now corrupt my 3 iron, what can I get out of it? So 191 carry, I have to say that's quite light for me. If I was on the golf course and I did my lasering, I would, I would expect my 4 or 5 iron to be a 191 carry. I did leave the face open and I took my path there. And the ball went quite high, so the square face, so I did hit a push there. I'm now playing more of a characteristic hook on the ball. So I've closed my face relative to my path. That would be a little more like it. Even after a wild push. Club speed within a mile, an hour. Carry 230, that's a lot more like it now. Total distance 230, I wouldn't be surprised by that. I did hit a push. Club path very heavy on the inside, club face quite open, 7.5. So when those two numbers there are similar, there's only 0.6 degrees of difference between them, that's when you get that straight push right at target. So my next shot's a bunker shot. But you know I'm good at bunkers anyway, so I'll just get up and down from there. So my total distance there, 230. So what it's telling me there, my three iron spread or my three iron range in a, in a thematically sealed environment like this of, of pure consistency in terms of air and wind and what have you, uh, is a 30-yard total distance spread on my 3-iron. So it's a very, very long-winded and detailed way of saying to you here that you don't hit every club a prescriptive distance. It works within a range. And that range should be quite varied. Now, uh, when we went to the Tour Pros distances here, if we look at the, 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 the widest distance spread between a pitching wedge and uh, any of the clubs was 12 yards, you remember? And the shortest was 9 yards. Uh, yeah, between the three iron and the four iron. Now, nine yards is a percentage of 200 and something yards, and 12 yards is a percentage here. So that's more or less, let's say, eight or nine percent. Uh, 12 yards uh, represents between the difference between a nine iron and a pitching wedge. That nine yards between a three and a four iron represents half of that, doesn't it? Is that right? Uh, yeah, so then they're about. So, Percentage-wise, there's a much greater gap between the 9-iron pitching wedge than there is between the 3 and 4-iron. 
Now, as I say, those are the averages. And so that's uh, much harder to, uh, uh, to say accurate for every player. Uh, but what we do know is that 12 yards is more or less the gap between most of the irons that the players hit if they were to swing the same way all the time. Now, I got asked a question a few weeks ago, do we change our swing when we're swinging? Mm, different clubs, not really. If you can alter the width of your stance and your ball position relative to the flight profile you're looking for, and the ball position relative to where you want to meet the ball in the path, then try and swing similarly. It won't feel the same or be the same swing because the, the length of the shaft of the club makes a big difference to that. Okay, so uh, Niles asked a question. What is your visual when you look down at a dress with a closed stance? Does the face seem slightly closed? Uh, I naturally uh, tow it in uh, one degree because I know that I'm aiming seven or eight degrees right of target. So as I'm looking down at it, relative to my path, it's way open. Uh, relative to my, uh, my uh, uh, target, it's way open. But I know that my path into the ball is going to bring that ball, hopefully, not in the last shot, hopefully back into the target. So as I'm looking down, I don't spend an awful lot of time thinking about where I'm looking at the ball. This is just personal now. Um, and if you look at Nick Faldo, he always talks about lasering the ball, really stare at it, keep your head steady, keep your head still. That's fantastic advice for most people anyway, until after impact. And most amateur golfers who are obsessed about keeping their head down tend to keep it down, down, down. It limits the follow through. They end up looking like they're trying to kiss the ball. So what the good players do is they'll stare at it and their swing goes under and through then the head releases. Look at the great photographs of Soren Stan, which I've got here. David Duval was another one who really moved his head towards the target. There's Soren Stan just before impact. Look where her visor is pointing already. So she released her head. She was an amazing golfer with Sorenstein. Again, just after impact, head is actually turned with her body. And again, there's, there's two parts of that photograph I really love. The first is she's releasing her, well, actually lots about that photo I love. The first is she's releasing uh, her body to the target. So she's turning around or pulling her left side out of the way. Her head's gone with it. You'd probably say her head has moved with the spinal angle there. She hasn't let the spinal angle go and kept her head there. She's moved everything around. Second thing is, I mean, could she be any more relaxed? She looks great. Great lesson for all of us there. And the third thing is look how the shaft of the club and her glove arm have created a lever. And we could actually look at that lever from the two profiles and see she's optimized the power of that lever. Because the first dimension we look at face on here, we create this lever here and we release it at the bottom. The closer we release it to the bottom, the better for the strike. That would be a corner release lever because nothing happens from over here. And this would also be a corner release lever because by the time that, that, that club head crosses past the hands, the power is now spent, the club decelerated. What we see in that picture there, if you're looking from this dimension, is that the lever would be optimized right here. From this angle, she's done the same thing here. Everything's in a straight line. If I was chopping something, bam. So as that lever has been released uh, uh, um, from two angles, first is that angle, second is that angle. We sort of combine those two angles together to create an off swing. She's in a perfectly aligned position there. So what Sorenstam does is as she swings, she lets the head go around, so she's free. Remarkable goal for Sorenstam. I reckon so quite a bit, actually, because she's a bit like Jack Nicholas. She made it all look so easy. When I look at her swing, um, it just looks so simple and so uncomplicated. It could actually be an amateur golfer swing. It doesn't look anything dramatic or like she's sort of uh, a super prime athlete. Now, she's certainly hit the weights very hard late in her career. Uh, and got very strong and very muscular. Um, but really, her swing is just a gentle, relaxed, uncomplicated movement. She has a very soft posture, so when she sets herself up to the ball, there's no sort of getting herself into this rigid position. She just bends her knees and tilts forward a bit. She swings the club up to a very soft position. There's no tension in the swing at all, and you can see that in her face. Okay, so um, what's your vision when you look down at a dress with a closed stance? Does her face seem slightly closed? Absolutely, yeah. 
it does. But I know it's, it's, it's open to my target, but close relative to uh, my address alignment. And then I will definitely try and close that face relative to my path during the swing. Relative to the target, I hit the ball from the inside with an open face, which brings about a banking left target. Now, again, that uh, is all uh, uh, terminology which we wouldn't have used 10, 15 years ago. Okay, Ian, so given all the variables in the swing, is there one which has the most impact on the gap between the clubs? Given that all the variables in the swing, what's the most impact on the gap between the clubs? It would be the club face uh, loft, most certainly. If I take my driver here and open the face or point it right at the target, that adds so much loft to the ball that the ball goes up with loads of spin, comes down, the gap between the, the, this and its next club along becomes much greater. So loft, I would say, has the biggest impact. Uh, and every ingredient in the soup uh, of the golf swing is important. Uh, it all depends really on the shot you're trying to hit, um, the swing style that you've got. Uh, but if you're meeting that ball with an inconsistent loft or too much loft or too little loft, that will have a dramatic impact on total distance. Um, that you hit the ball. Alrighty, so any questions about what I've talked about there, uh, about gapping and how the bag works? When I look at my set of clubs there, let the camera down here again here. Driver, indiscriminate distance. Three wood, indiscriminate distance off the fairway. Rescue wood, a regularly used club, so it's all about digging the club out of the rubbish. Then the gap uh, between my three iron and my rescue wood is overlapped. It's the, few, it's the only uh, two clubs in my bag where there's an overlap. But they can't do the same job because they're two completely different clubs. Similar length, so that's the gap between them, one inch max. But two high profile, they're two loft profiles which are very, uh, very different. And this leading edge here, so if you look at, talk about the uh, golf club design. The datum line runs from the middle of the shaft through the head and the leading edge on a, a rescue wood. This front part here is a long way in front of the datum line. Remember the datum line runs right through the middle of the shaft all the way down. Leading edge a long way forward. That helps get a much cleaner strike. With uh, my three iron, the leading edge and the datum line are just almost aligned. The three iron uh, leading edge is slightly in front of the datum line. To help amateur golfers get a golf ball airborne, we try and have an offset head so the club head moves backwards slightly, and that helps get the club a little bit more underneath the ball. Mel, can you hit two shots within a mid iron? Uh, one with a couple of inches more of the handle protruding, distance change. Okay, let me do that. So, a question actually, Mel. So mid iron seven iron I'll take. So really what you're saying is well, what's the impact of me holding my hand a little lower if I was to swing similarly on both swings. So I've got a seven iron here. What I'll do first of all is the standard distance shot right in right at target. Close my face relative to that alignment and try and play a, uh, a draw spin. I'm expecting 180 yards max out of this. One seventy-three. Okay, so let's look at that. Mm -hmm. Club head speed for a tour pro with that club is 90 miles an hour. Club head speed for me was 88.8. .8. I'd be happy with that. I carried it 166.7. They're carrying it uh, uh, 172. So I'm a full six yards uh, difference in carry distance, even though I'm swinging within one mile an hour of them. Their quality of strike is much better than mine, um, even though I hit the one well. Um, and also, I do use bladed clubs, in fairness. Not every tour pro uses bladed clubs, and uh, I love bladed clubs. I play them for vanity, I play them for enjoyment, uh, and not for performance. Um, if I was looking for more for performance, I'd definitely have a cavity back, but I love my blades, uh, and I'm quite happy to sacrifice distance on them. That's my excuse for not being quite as long as a tour pro, anyway. 
Um, uh, Kerry 166 Mel, and what Trackman Optimizer is telling me here is off of 88.9 miles per hour, the optimum distance I could have carried it was uh, 170. I hit it 167. So that tells me that was a pretty fair strike. If I then place my handle down, hands down the handle, down to about there, not an uncommon shot for me to play, I want to take a little bit off of it. Interestingly, so with the quirks of the swing, Greg Norman's little finger just rested at the top of the handle there, and he had his hand outside the top of the handle. A very strong, very physical man. Um, but that's how he did it. Ben Hogan's uh, grips, along with many tour pros, were put on misaligned, so that when he put his hands on the handle, the club face would be open. So you have his hands on the handles, the club base would always sit open. That's just the way he liked to play. So if I had 167 to uh, carry it to 173 on that shot, I'm going to take a couple of inches here. I'll feel more like my 99 now. Same swing. 88.8 miles an hour. So 88.8 miles an hour, so it's a full 2.2 .2 miles an hour slower. I carried it 165, which is not a great deal of difference, is it? That's actually two yards difference. A 2.6 yards difference. So 2.6 yards uh, difference in total distance, club head speed, 2.2, uh, uh, total distance, was similar, wasn't it? I got that to 172.5. So in fairness, Mel, not an awful lot on that shot there. And again, I think this uh, is answering the, the question itself, really. 172, yes, it's... I've lost half a yard. Now, that's assuming I made the same swing, the same policy strike and what have you. <laughs> and that goes right back to the original premise of this whole lesson, is the range in which we hit shots um, is absolutely huge. And the tour pros have it's been proven many times that if tour pros play with half a set of irons and actually put more wedges in the bag, their scores are probably likely to be better. Alrighty, uh, any more questions? While I'm waiting for any more questions, I will hit a, another shot where I hit a slice. Now remember my swing is heavy on the inside, and the 90 degree path on that one there. I'm going to cut across, across this one. My total distance I'm hitting my seven, I'd say is 172, 173 on those two shots. I'm going to purposely play a fade now. I put that one heavy, so it's not the best uh, result. I'm going to hold that. Yeah, there you go. So I hit the one well, actually. Top head speed, go within range. But look at the carry there, the two fades that I hit. 147, wasn't a great strike, but 160 total compared to very consistent numbers there at 172, 173. So I meant to say at the beginning of the session, actually, the way to get consistent with your gapping is to optimize your distance. Now you've heard me use the word optimize distance uh, in every session that I've done, how we optimize the distance with the driver. The way that works with the iron shots uh, is that if you optimize the distance, the gap between the clubs becomes uh, easy to control. The, uh, the range of distance that you hit on a normal swing becomes a little tighter. There's obviously lots of variables in that. But that'd be quite a stark example, wouldn't it? Now, I've spent so many years of my career trying to fight a hook the wrong way. Oh, trying to hit a fade, trying to hit a fade, trying to hit a fade. I end up with garbage like that, you know, 13 yards spread between shots. Now, for me to the 7 iron 147 is ridiculous when I know that an optimized distance is 172, 173. Now, we're not trying to wallop the ball as far as possible all the time, but we are trying to create an optimal strike which hits the ball squarely and on target, and therefore we hit the optimum distance. So I'm actually quite glad you asked that question there uh, about what the uh, Ian asked it, what's the, uh, the variable, what's the, what has the most impact on, on that gapping. The answer to that question is the intention of the shot you're trying to play. Now, in my game, my yardage allows it when I try and fade, 
and they're tight and longer when I try and hit a, a draw spin. In your game, in internet, you ask the question, is it the way around? And when we, if, we, if you were to measure your hook uh, shots, which is your error, your range would be massive and you'd hit the ball less distance. And your averages for your fade or a shot which hits slightly left of target will be much, much tighter and further up the field. Alrighty, so we've covered a lot of ground there today. And uh, it's quite an interesting session that, because it's one of those things which, when I'm giving you a lesson, I would spend 45 minutes or 50 minutes, whatever we've done here, talking in such depth about uh, that uh, part of the game. But there's an awful lot of information hidden within that part of the game. And it's amazing how, and I'm guilty of this as, as much as you are, it's amazing how when I look at uh, information online, I'm studying other uh, coaches and what here, we end up talking about a position in the swing or a technical movement or a way of saying or thinking of something. And yet hidden within all that are so many other really big questions which affect how you play the game. Which Harmon gave a great interview uh, over Zoom uh, two weeks ago. And he was saying the first thing you look for is how can I get this person to play better? Not swing better, but play better. And if you look at Tiger's swing when Butch Harmon was teaching him, there are many quirks in it. You know, Tiger swung the club and he got it across the line here. So you don't have to look very far to look at Tiger Woods in 1997 online to find pictures of the club chef pointing over here. After he left uh, Butch Harmon, he spent a few years trying to get the club to do the opposite. He was swinging what we call laid off over here. And without doubt, Tiger uh, had his uh, worst driving stats in that period, but he won, a many, he won many events, won loads of majors. So did it affect his driving? Well, it's very likely it did. Um, his ability to win? Definitely not. What could have been, though, is, is another argument at that level. You can say, wow, you know, could he have had um, more uh, more majors if he if he stayed with his old swing? But you never know. And that's the thing. Those guys are never-endingly searching for uh, what comes into the next level. Very famous case of Ian Baker Finch, who, when he won the Open Championship, uh, went to his coach and said, I want to swing hit the ball further, his coach said, forget about it, you're the Open champion, best player in the world right now. He said, no, I want 25 more yards. Uh, and he went down, you know, several dead ends and lost his game, really. Very sad story. Alrighty, well, thanks, Mel. Cheerio. Um, thanks for tuning in. And no doubt I'm going to see all of you this week uh, in one form or another. Um, the protocols for the club are very easy to follow. Uh, you book your time, you arrive 10 minutes before, you come to the marshal, he'll send, he'll check you off and make sure you're at the right place. Uh, and then you go and play. And then as soon as you've finished your round, you walk off the golf course back to your car and then you go home. Uh, members have been great this morning uh, and they're enjoying themselves. So I wish you all uh, um, a nice weekend, uh, good health, and I look forward to seeing you all this week. So thanks ever so much and uh, see you all soon. All the best.